Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. So before we start today's episode, we're talking about saving villages. I figure we should also talk about saving your Minecraft world, because this weekend I had a pretty catastrophic thing happen to my PC where it wouldn't boot properly, and I had to completely reinstall Windows and Minecraft and a lot of the other software that I use. I was able to save all of my files though, so the Minecraft Survival Guide world is still okay, but just in case you need to back up your world for any reason, there is a way to do that from within the Minecraft menu. You're doing this on Java Edition at least, you can hit the edit button here and click make backup and that will save it to a backups folder which you can also open from this menu here. Once it finishes backing up the world it will have a little message pop up in the top right hand corner of the screen like so and if you need to navigate to your backups folder at any point you can open it from this menu option here. So yes, welcome back to the Minecraft survival guide. I hope you're having a better day than I did on Friday. But anyway, we are back here in the Minecraft Survival Guide world, fresh from the last episode, complete with the two villagers that we now have hanging out here on the plains, and a couple of villagers in an igloo over there. Now the ones in the igloo, despite there being a zombie spawner nearby, will actually be fine and protected from any zombie attacks, but these two are kind of out here in the open right now. So along with choosing a profession for Regis, we're also going to take a quick look at how to protect these isolated villagers out in the wild and for the rest of the video we're going to go to a couple of naturally generated villages and take a look at how to protect them from zombies and other threats as well. Of course now it is raining <laughs> so now I really want to put a roof over the head of this poor Fletcher villager who's just wandering around at the moment but the thing you'll notice about villagers is that at certain times of day you can't really control a whole lot about where they go. Typically if they are working they'll be hanging around their workstation like this refreshing their trades every so often but it's kind of difficult to get villagers to go where you want them to unless you decide that you're going to put them in a boat. So that's what we're going to do with this guy since he is just kind of casually wandering around. I'm going to row the boat up to him and once he moves, there we go, he should end up getting into the boat. And so like before, I'm going to drop him off here and I'm going to start building a spruce box around him, mostly to make sure that he can just be in here with his workstation while we do the next part. Now we'll take the villager out of the boat like so. There we go. And one of the things you'll notice is that you can still pick up items through the corners of a setup like this. So an item entity that's resting on the ground can still be picked up by a player if you end up walking up to the corner of two blocks arranged like this. And the same thing is true of zombie attacks on villagers. If a zombie were to come up to this corner here, the hitbox of the zombie might overlap with the villager's hitbox and it would be able to deal damage. And as I explained in the last video, zombies doing damage to villagers can result in them either dying or becoming zombie villagers again. So the first thing I'm actually going to do is rest to make sure that the knight does doesn't fall and that monsters don't show up because I really don't want any zombies interfering with what I'm doing right now. So now I'm going to talk to this villager a couple of times just to try and lure him as close as possible into this corner where his workstation is. Because villagers will typically walk a little closer to you so it looks like they are listening to you when you interact with them. So from that I was able to place a couple of blocks behind him real quick. We can put another one in the corner there and there we go. He's now in this one by one space. We can put a block over his head, we can pop a torch in here and he is at least in this area next to his workstation. And if there are blocks at head height, he won't be able to move anywhere. Obviously, if there's just a block at his legs, he'll be able to walk up over it. But with a block over his head, he won't be able to do that either. So in theory, we could remove all of the blocks from around the outside here and the villager is nice and open, we can walk up and trade with him and he's going to stick around here. Now the main problem is going to be protecting him from zombies getting him from the corners like this. So we're going to make a few fences, like so, we'll make a couple of those. We can place those all the way around the outside like this. And now the zombie will only be able to get this far, which won't be quite close enough to reach this villager. The one remaining problem is baby zombies, who are only one block tall, so they'd be able to hop up over the top of this, get in close to this villager and attack him, or even stand in the same space as the villager, at which point the player is going to have a very hard time hitting them and not the villager. So what I'm going to do in this case is break down a few more spruce planks, turn those into four trap doors, and then create some slabs that we can use to make like a canopy over this villager. We'll put the slabs around the top of this like so, kind of creating a little trading post, and then the trap doors we can either place like so on here or we can place them on top of the blocks surrounding the villager. I also feel kind of bad that he doesn't have a great deal of headroom in here. This block here is actually kind of low to his head so what we might do is remove that block there. We'll attach a slab to the side of that one there like so and then we'll put that slab back on top of the trapdoor. So the villager hasn't been able to move anywhere during this process but he is now safely enclosed in here 
and this gap is too small for a baby zombie to run in and hit him. He's also got a torch inside of there so that no mobs will be able to spawn inside of him because there won't be any darkness around here, and the torch will light up in a radius around the villager, making sure mobs don't spawn within 15 blocks of his little trading post. You can also hear from the occasional sounds of him using this fletching table that he's able to visit his job site block and refresh his trades. That's really important for villagers' trades. If we were to trade sticks with him a bunch of times, this trade would lock and we wouldn't be able to trade it anymore until he visited his workstation to refresh his trades. This only happens twice per day, so you can get through three trading sessions of sticks with this guy before he locks up for the day and you have to wait for the following day in order to trade more sticks. So it's important that he has access to this fletching table and that he's not just stuck in a box somewhere unable to reach it. So as far as protecting your villagers from zombie attacks goes, this is a pretty decent setup that still feels like a market stall and isn't just like a booth in a wall somewhere or a hole in the ground to protect them from zombie attacks. And for some people, it might seem a little bit brutal and minimal. This villager doesn't have access to a bed, for example, and they are just living out their life in a one by one area, which doesn't seem like a lot. But hey, again, it's a video game. This is the same video game in which we're keeping our cows and other animals in a very cramped looking pen and a occasionally just slaughtering them with a sword for food, so it's not exactly something we have to live up to realistic life standards. But if you want to do that kind of stuff for your villagers, it's entirely possible to build them their own house. The main thing, as usual, is going to be keeping them protected from zombie attacks. Now, you might be wondering about pillagers. Since they are armed with crossbows and have ranged attacks, it should be possible for them to shoot this villager, especially since the trap doors leave him out in the open like this. And that's one of the reasons why, eventually, we'll be moving this villager into a more permanent accommodation like a villager trading hall, a dedicated building which is going to allow us to have a bunch of villagers all in the same place, protected from anything that could potentially harm them. But I believe it is still the case that pillagers are programmed not to spawn any time there is a village in the direct proximity. So they could spawn a good distance away and walk over here, but they are unlikely to spawn within a certain radius of a village. And a village in Minecraft's terms is technically defined as a villager and any point of interest, whether it's a workstation block or a bed. If you have a minimum of those two things, you will have a village. So technically, this area should now be fairly protected from pillager spawns for the next little while. And so we're going to build a similar little trading booth for Regis, who are actually going to turn into a new professional profession we haven't discussed yet. We're going to turn seven slabs into a composter, like so, and Regis is going to become a farmer. I'm going to keep him in roughly the same area as our unnamed Fletcher, so we're just going to put a couple of blocks around the outside here. We're going to add another block over his head, like so, and we're going to remove that block. He should now be able to access this composter, and that will encourage him to become a farmer. There we go, he gets the straw hat. And if we take a look at his trades, you'll notice we can sell him crops that we've been growing in exchange for emeralds, which makes farmers really valuable in the early game when crop farming is a lot of what you've been doing. So just like before, I've surrounded Regis with the blocks and fences that I think are going to keep him safe from zombies and baby zombies. And in the process of that, he actually changed his trades as though he disconnected and reconnected to the composter. So now he's buying potatoes for emeralds or he's buying emeralds in exchange for bread. And since we've been growing carrots and potatoes from a pretty early episode, this is going to be a really valuable set of trades for us. We can even maximize this by using a fortune tool to harvest these crops because yes, fortune does work on crops. By harvesting two rows of nine potatoes, I got basically a stack and a half out of that. Meanwhile, without the fortune pickaxe, I'm going to break two rows of potatoes and see how many we get. It's not nearly as many. Without fortune, we only ended up with a stack of potatoes and two left over. So it's pretty clear a fortune pickaxe is going to get us the most out of our potato harvest. Anyway, let's head back to Regis the farmer and see if he is still trading potatoes. He is. So we can lock in those trades by trading potatoes to him a couple of times and you will see that now his XP bar has filled up. For the first time, Regis will upgrade his profession. Those pink particles usually mean an upgrade. He's also holding out something that he's interested in trading. He's gonna ask some emeralds for a variety of different foodstuffs now. We've got bread, pumpkin pies, and apples appearing in the trades. We're gonna do the same with our Fletcher, trading him a bunch of sticks that we've broken down from logs and planks, but we're not going to do that right now. With these two villagers relatively well protected over here, we're gonna head out to a naturally generated village, and we're gonna take a look at how to protect one of those from zombie attacks. 
Hey folks, welcome back. So for our example village, I decided to go back to the first village I ever encountered in this world, and it's one that I stayed away from deliberately so that we could come back and take care of the villagers in future. But it also happens to be next to this ruined nether portal that we repaired in a previous episode, so I'm pretty sure we'll be able to come back here anytime we want to if we want to continuously trade with these villagers. And this village is on a savanna biome, and it looks relatively small from this side, although there are already some things that I think we need to protect these villagers from. There's a couple of nasty pitfalls and stuff nearby. So this is a natural village environment. You'll find a few basic houses around here. You'll sometimes find the villagers working or sleeping or gossiping in and around these houses. But it looks like there's a couple of very small houses up here on this hill, and there's really not much to this village. A couple of pathways, a couple of crop farms, some houses down here by the water, some up here on the land. And as you'll see, the villagers here have slightly different outfits from the ones that we've already encountered. There are five different types of naturally generated villages occurring in different biomes. You'll find them in the plains biomes, savannas, tiger biomes with the spruce trees, snow plains, and deserts. So those are the five biomes you will typically find villages generating in. There are also two villager outfits that don't appear naturally anywhere in the game unless one of your villages happens to overlap with a jungle or a swamp. If a village happens to generate on the edge of one of those biomes and any of the villagers are born in that biome, then they will show up with slightly different outfits to the villagers around them. But it's pretty rare for that to happen. But as you can see, village life here is proceeding fairly naturally. The villagers are going in and out of their houses. There are even some baby villagers in here jumping jumping on the beds and, I guess, guarding some of the loot that is in here. The first piece of advice I will give you for protecting a natural village like this is to arrive during the day and keep it daytime as much as possible, because these villages are typically most threatened during the nighttime, when zombies can spawn out on the surface, and the player can't be in multiple places at once. So unless you've got a team of you to protect the village, it seems unlikely that you're going to be able to fend off some naturally spawned zombies. The village has its own natural protector though, and every village will spawn with an iron golem by default. The villagers can also create additional iron golems if they feel threatened, and we'll look at the exact mechanics of that in a future episode. If you've got a lot of iron, it's even possible for you to build your own iron golems to help. But the iron golem is naturally the villagers' protector, and they should be treated with care. Any naturally spawned iron golems will become hostile to the player, if you attack them. And they hit extremely hard, so don't even think about tapping these guys even with a playful punch. You are going to end up in a lot of trouble. The village also has some natural protection in terms of light sources, and that's one of the first tips I will give you if you want to protect a village more permanently and you don't want to be sleeping every single night you are here. I recommend creating a perimeter of torches that's going to light up the area around the village and prevent zombies from spawning in the vicinity. Each torch gives off a light level of 14, so you'll only really run into a dark area once you are 14 blocks away from the torch if you're going in a straight line. But a torch's light spreads in a radius, in a kind of diamond pattern, and so each block adjacent to it is going to receive one less light, but the diagonal blocks are going to receive even less. Which means you can't just place a torch every 28 blocks, because you've got to consider the diagonals. So we're going to sleep real fast, just to make sure that no zombies come out at night and disturb these villagers. And we're going to go around the perimeter of the village, placing a torch every 14 or 15 blocks. We don't have to be too precise about that, and to be honest, it's probably a better thing that we're not, because if you consider the terrain around here, sometimes there are going to be crevices in the terrain where nearby light will not always reach. So unless you're keen on completely flattening the terrain, which kind of removes some of the character from this area, it's worth it just to place torches wherever you feel they are necessary, and bear in mind that when it gets darker, you'll be able to see where some of the dark spaces are and potentially take care of them before they become a problem. Another thing I will recommend doing is taking care of any other potential environmental hazards for the villagers, like flowing water like this, which is generated naturally as part of the villagers' farmland, but should probably be blocked off so that it 
it doesn't sweep the villagers away from something they're trying to get to. Likewise, caves like this are potentially going to be a problem because the villagers will wander down into this, they'll drop down a couple of blocks, and they won't be able to find their way back up. They can't pillar around like players can. And natural nearby caves, especially if they're as dark as ones like this, will need to be lit up to prevent zombies from spawning here. Normally I would want to repair this terrain with some natural looking blocks, but the terrain here is already a bit of a mess, and judging by the amount of floating sand around here, if I place one block, this is all going to fall down. I'm going to craft a few more torches, we're going to place a couple of those down here in the ravine, and then I'm going to build a platform over the top of this. There we go, even more of the sand is falling in over there. It's probably a good idea to make sure that the villagers aren't around while you do this. I'm running a little low on wood now, but you get the idea. We've created a sort of beach boardwalk for these villagers, but at least it means they'll be safe and shouldn't fall into a ravine that's generated right next to their homes. As I mentioned in the previous video though, monsters will spawn with a 120 28 block radius around the player. So that is the radius in which zombies can spawn and the area that you can potentially expect to light up if you don't want a zombie to spawn near your village. That's also 128 block radius around the player, not around the village itself. So if you're standing in one corner, it's entirely possible that zombies could be spawning at the other corner. So if you want to make sure the villagers stay protected without having to light up a huge radius around the village, it is entirely practical that you might want to build a fence around a village area. Some sort of perimeter fence or wall is going to keep the zombies out whilst also keeping the villagers in. And so there are only a couple of things to bear in mind when creating a perimeter fence like this. The first of which is to make sure that any areas like this where the fence has to go up over a block are joined up like so, because there is a possibility that if you leave a fence open like this, a zombie is going to be able to walk from this block up onto the fence, since they're one and a half blocks tall, and still hop over. So you need to make sure that these fences connect around corners where there is a step up in the terrain. The other thing is that the reverse can happen, because any time a fence connects to a block like this, a villager could jump up onto this, and then they can walk over the next set of fences. So it might be a good idea to remove blocks that connect to the fences, just so your villagers don't get out either. It's fine if they connect to the blocks on the side like that, but connecting to a block that doesn't continue the line of the fence, not the best idea. Really, the other thing to consider, though, is the cost of materials. I crafted 48 fences from a couple of acacia trees that I had taken down, and that doesn't even cover one side of the perimeter of this village. These can be pretty large areas. So if you are going to fence off the outside of a village, that's going to take a bit of time and effort. So keep that in mind if you want to take on a project of this size. Yep, some of these villagers have already gotten lost in a cave down here, and thankfully this cave is sort of shallow and doesn't go especially far, but you can imagine a baby zombie spawning down here and coming up through this crag into the area. We should create a little staircase for them so that they can pathfind back to their beds, and as you can see, they're already hopping up here, and I already hopped down into another cave that could be disastrous if a villager were to wander in. Villagers are a hazard to themselves more often than not, it turns out, so we should bear that in mind when we're trying to protect this village. And I should also note that it's possible to set up trading booths on a very small scale like we did over at our starter house, and we could block these villagers in their houses if we thought the environment was going to be unsafe for them. But I think if you want to keep that natural village life going on, if you want to see them running around during the day and meeting with each other and trading and all of that stuff, I think it's really nice to have a natural layout to a village, and so it's important to know a few tricks for keeping the village safe in a natural setting like this. In fact, one of the other things I will recommend is that if you feel like a village is going to be in danger, you don't have access to a bed and you don't have anything that you can use to protect the village at short notice, one of the best things to do is just to get further away. Run out across the nearby terrain and put 128 blocks of distance between you and the village, because once you're that far away, there's no chance of any monsters spawning inside the perimeter of the village. Any that do will hopefully be taken care of by the Iron Golem, the zombies won't have any chance to threaten the villagers, and hopefully life should continue as normal. Then once the sun comes up, you can return to the village, and you can be fairly certain that if any zombies zombies did happen to spawn in the perimeter, they'll already have started burning in the sun. And a little while later, I've managed to build a perimeter fence all the way around the entire village, and I am going to give this whole system 
a stress test, I guess you could call it. I'm going to let it get dark around here. I'm going to wait and see when the monsters come out, and I'm going to see if any of them appear in the village itself whilst patrolling the perimeter to check for things like dark areas. Now, the game in Java Edition at least does provide a way for you to check whether there are dark areas in your world or not. If you look at the client light stat on the left hand side there below all of the coordinates and chunk data and which way we're facing, you will notice that it says one block on there, and that is basically how much block light there is. If that value reaches zero anywhere, that is where mobs can potentially spawn. So while this corner is obviously a dark area and does look like it could spawn mobs, technically speaking the game is unable to spawn anything here because the light from nearby torches is just about reaching this area. Still, I feel like just lighting this area up nice and evenly, so we're going to place a few torches in and around those areas, and we're looking for dark areas where we can just pop a torch down as it gets dark and quiet around here. Because the most important thing is really to make sure there are no spots inside of our fence where mobs could potentially spawn. So areas like up here where it's a little dark could use a torch. Right here I believe this area is protected by the torches on top of there, but we could maybe even pop some torches on the fence itself as little aesthetic details. Villagers can still take fall damage, so there are a couple of areas where there's a short cliff that they could drop off around here but at least the area below that is lit up and it's looking like having done a quick trip around the outside of the village we seem to have eliminated any threat of mobs spawning on the inside. If I can get up to a higher place, if I can take a quick look from maybe the, the boughs of this tree, we can see some monsters spawning out there in the distance, but they are far enough away that they aren't pathfinding in towards the village. They're not sniffing out any of these villagers in their homes, and the villagers will all go to bed and rest during the night. So it seems like we have protected this village from a potential zombie attack. See, a couple of zombies have now spawned in the shade of these acacia trees, this one is pathfinding towards me, but he doesn't seem to be able to get beyond the fence that I have built. It might be worth quickly testing whether or not there is a spot that he could get inside the boundary of the village fence, but it seems like, for the most part, our villagers are going to be safe here. Obviously, it's possible for mobs like spiders to jump over the fence, but spiders aren't going to harm villagers. They will go after the player, but they will not go after villagers in the same way that zombies do. So at this point, I think this test has proven a success. I'm going to sleep in my bed for the night, and we should find that all of the villagers wake up in the morning ready to go to work. The zombies around the outside are burning in the sun, and this village has been protected. So in terms of the priorities here, in terms of what you should really do first and foremost to protect a village, I would say make sure that you can keep it daytime, so bring a bed with you to sleep through the night or use one of the village beds if you don't mind kicking a villager out of it. Light the area up to prevent mob spawns. Torches are your best friend in situations like this where you don't want zombies spawning near the village. Make sure the naturally spawned iron golems are here and willing to do their job, and even introduce more of them to the village if you feel like you need to. We'll discuss making our own iron golems in a future episode, but just know it needs full blocks of iron and carved pumpkins. And finally, I think the perimeter fence is still a pretty good idea, although it does come with a significant investment of both time and materials. Plus, there are a few of these fiddly areas where you need to make sure that no blocks are making contact with the sides of the fence so that mobs or villagers could hop over them. So for now, from our little Savannah Village project, now freshly protected from zombie attacks, that is where we're going to leave this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. We're going to spend a few more episodes this week talking about villagers, how we can breed them, the different villager professions, and what trades you can expect to get when you've leveled up your villagers. But for now, that's going to be it, so thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care, bye for now.